What we're going to do is we're going to talk about, and like I said, if it does cut out a bit, don't be afraid to stop and ask a question if you miss something. So we're going to talk about the robotic milking systems. And the big question is, does it make dollars and cents? And I'm going to show a lot of different types of uh, robots as we go through the presentation. I have no endorsement of any of the robots over one over another. But I do want to show you some of the things that are happening within some of the robot uh, companies that they're taking a look at. So when we take a look at does it make dollars and cents, it really there's a lot of different ways to look at it. So I want to kind of explain what the robots are, what they can do, and then we'll kind of get into some of the economics of it. So we realize that as dairy producers, um, every farm is different. I've been on probably 1,400 farms in my extension career over the 26 years that I've been working with uh, dairy, and I've never seen two farms that are alike, two managers that manage alike. Okay, so this is down in uh, Bloomfield, Iowa, and just when you take a look at how do you incorporate TMRs into an Amish dairy farm, and can, we all have different resources and um, things to play with. So they basically add the uh, the horses with a, um, a gasoline engine being pulled and then pulling the TMR mixers. So... Again, whatever technology works on your farm is how we're going to try to incorporate. So whether the robots do or don't depends on a lot of factors. So why do we invest in the robots in the first place? So when we take a look at even on large-scale dairies, this could make some sense. And I'm not saying uh, when you take a look even at the ec economics of it, does it make um, good economic sense? Sometimes there's a little bit of a question uh, if they do or not. But there's other reasons besides money that people are putting robots in. So we realize how labor intensive that dairy is. So 40 to 50 percent of the total labor bill sometimes uh, comes just in the, in the milking phase. And so labor can be 20 to 30 percent of a dairy farm's expense. And we realize just um, especially on large farms, the number of skilled workers, how many shifts per day, and finding qualified workers to be able to work those shifts can be kind of expensive and difficult and sometimes often frustrating because it's a pretty repetitive tax uh, and it um, in and of itself doesn't require a lot of decision making and we realize also that cows thrive on consistency and dependability but one of the biggest things I would tend to say about robots is just amazing the amount of data that robots can actually uh, uh, put with us so every time a cow goes through that robot there's over a hundred measurements that get taken on that cow for various things or uh, through the whole system so one of the things we um, <clears throat> my slides are not advancing for one reason or another <gasps> Huh. And then I'm getting a technical difficulty. The slide there it goes. Okay, so this is what we call the dashboard. So this dashboard is basically kind of showing, you know, every, I mean, any time of the day I can take a look at this. And so this is total milk production. How many pounds have the cows been producing here in the last 24 hours versus in parentheses in the last seven days or so? Each one of the robots have some kind of a, a data set that they put together. So you can come in every morning, every afternoon, and just look at this data quick. What are the big things you want to see if it's working correctly? You can see uh, the milk and cows per day is down the last 24 hours compared to the last week. Why is that? The milkings are down. Uh, the failures are not the problem. So there's a lot of different things you can take a look at, but I just wanted to show you that as kind of example of what happens with some of these robots. So again, I basically said, you know, why do people choose the robots? It's not a big economic decision. I mean, it, I, actually, in the reverse of that is it, it is a big economic decision, but the big thing people are taking a look at is just how can they deal with the labor on their farms. So if we look at how to best evaluate a new technology for each of your farms, if people ask me, do robots make sense, this is my answer. If you're solely looking at cash flow, I can show you analyses that I've done with uh, different producers where it was a negative $50,000 cash flow up to a positive $20,000 cash flow on two to three robots. If we look at a net financial impact, which is more the profitability of it, which is a big difference compared to cash flow ability, and we'll take a look at that this afternoon, um, a negative 25000 up to a positive 35000 when producers come and ask about the quality of life, uh, we look at a positive 10000 a positive 20000 I guess I even have heard one that put it up to about $50,000 uh, of quality life each year just because they have the robots and they don't have to get up and milk at a certain time or be so tied to the, the milking system itself. So when you take a look at the cash flow ability versus the net financial impact and the quality of life, um, it could be a minus 50,000. This could be a positive 50,000. So we're going to go through a little bit later on how to put it a, a, make a decision on a robotic system for about 140 cows. <clears throat> so when you take a look at robots, 
what do you compare it to? Do you compare it to your system that you're currently running to now robots, or do you compare it to a possibility that you could put in a low-cost parlor as well? So the parlor on the left is probably the most efficient parlor that I've ever stepped my foot in in the last 26 years. It's a trans-Iowa low-cost milking parlor. And it's kind of like um, the Ireland, New Zealand, Australia type uh, thought process. Um, this one person in a swing 15 is milking about 70 to 80 cows per person per hour. He's the only one in the pit milking in this system. And you can actually find videos of this on my um, internet website if you just Google my name. But when you take a look at can I milk cows for less than a dollar per hundred weight with all investment and labor included, or do I put in um, uh, a, a robot? which might be two to three dollars a hundred weight or hundred weight at some point in times and when we take a look at what can we milk um, like I said this one here is actually milking 70 to 80 cows per person per, uh, per hour versus a robot that might be in that 4,500 to 6,000 uh, pounds per robot per day so it's a different thought process how we actually take a look at it yeah, and I realize this is a second um, <clears throat> for the yep. people in the room and also the people watching I want people to know that on Monday Larry is going to be presenting at the St. Jay location and talking more about the Trans Air, uh, Iowa design because for, for people who don't want to go in the direction of robots but do want to find something more efficient, uh, there are a lot of details to, uh, to go with that. So just want to put a plug in for that. Yeah, I appreciate that, Dan. So if we look at this slide, which uh, can you see it from where you're sitting? Yep. Can you see the numbers? I guess I should say can you read it? So um, on the left side is we have our stall barn, milking twice a day. The second uh, column is our low-cost parlor. The third column is the medium to high-cost parlor. The uh, fourth column is actually a, um, a double-eight milking 660 cows that I just wanted to put in there for a cross-comparison, milking uh, 22 hours a day in that parlor. And then our last one is the, um, the thought process of what this robot might take a look at. So if we take a look at the robot itself, if we go all the way down here to the bottom where the cursor is heading down, the cost per hundredweight of a stall barn can actually get quite expensive, especially on that number of cows. So 140 cows, very few people, but we do still have some that kind of milk through a stall barn with that number of cows. But even in that 70 cow range, these stall barns get pretty expensive in the $1.60, $1.70, 100 weight range. And so I sometimes make the comment that even if you gave me a stall barn, free of charge, I probably still cannot afford to milk it in, okay, just because of the, the labor cost uh, associated with everything that goes on there. So the second one we're going to take a look at is the, uh, the low-cost parlor, and I'm having a hard time finding where my cursor is. Okay, so a low-cost parlor, we've seen these run anywhere from uh, 65 cents up to about a dollar hundred weight, so definitely a very low-cost way to milk cows. And when I say low-cost, I don't want you to think anything ne negative, because when I say low-cost, I tend to say that this is probably the most, the highest efficient, most ergonomically and safest way to milk a cow than a lot of these um, parlors that you can actually buy from an equipment dealer. So I'll definitely put that parlor up against just about any parlor uh, that I know. So the, the third one is the medium to high cost, starts getting over $2 a hundred weight. Um, this conventional double, we can take a look at those being pretty ex um, low cost as well. So where does the robot fill in? Um, I can do a lot of different analyses with m different milk prices and just different assumptions within the robot. Here I've got it at systems have cost. Some are just more expensive than others. And yeah, robots might be the most um, um, highest cost one, but there's other reasons why people do it as well. So the graph here just kind of shows in a graphic form just those different kinds so again the tie stall barn on the far left can be pretty expensive your robots on the far right some parlors can actually cost more than the robots but these tie stall barns tend to be pretty expensive as well Okay, so this is just um, some examples as I spend some time in Europe of different types of robotic systems that are either doing the feed systems or we're doing, um, hang on a second here. 
different types of feed systems or the top right one is actually um, a conveyor that goes into the freestall barn and actually beds and put the bale in there and it actually shreds and goes up over top the uh, freestall barn so you don't even have to go into the freestall barn so this is a very hands-off type approach in the bottom left these cows are being fed about 22 times a day and it's just everything was just all automatic so it's not just the milking system that's going to be uh, automated over time with this feed system and even the bedding systems can get out um, automatic over time as well so when we take a look at robots yeah there's been a lot of robots being put in here when we take a look at the uh, thought process um, my feeling is that this thing's going to double every three or four years and so when we started back in 92 here in the states the first robot i think was in wisconsin um, and some people say that thing that robot is actually still uh, working so by the time we got into the 2013 you can see where the totals were and you can also see in the red was actually where the laybot lately which were the most popular ones at the time, and they still are the most popular. Uh, they got in the market uh, before anybody else. And you can kind of see what those numbers are. And now we're gonna take a look at where we're just beginning in 2016. So the estimation is uh, we're gonna be approaching probably close to 40,000 by the end of the year 2016 into 2017 of how many robots. So um, again, it's kind of going on that exponential uh, phase and we don't really see it stopping uh, too much here. So how many are here in North America? About in, in 2014, the data was about 2,500 units. So we suspect that's probably getting closer to um, 28 and maybe even touching around uh, 3,000 on around, uh, I know Wisconsin has about 300 farms just themselves. Uh, we've got about 44 or 45 in Iowa. Um, when you take a look at the uh, the different data of the robot. So we realize that these robots are very well engineered. Um, they tend to milk better than we as human beings and they're very consistent. So I had the privilege of about three, four years ago to spend some time about three weeks in Europe visiting a lot of these robotic companies and kind of seeing the engineering and how these are built in some of their factories and things like that. So this one factory actually built about four different types of robots. So you can kind of see the different colors of the pans of who they build these robots for and then they just get a different name uh, put on them. So when we were in Sweden, we um, saw this one um, and one of the comments, just one thing about robots is you're on call 24-7, uh, but it's amazing what this system can do. And so here we're on a research farm on the bottom right there and just take a look and some of that was kind of proprietary information at the time, but just what they can do about, um, you know, measuring the ketones um, in, the, in the cows, letting them know do they need some kind of a, a ketosis treatment. Um, you know, during their, with, with their feet or whatever, during the, um, the milking phase, there's just a lot of information. It's just amazing information that comes out of these robots. Uh, Tone from Germany here has the, um, the multi-box system from GIA, so you can kind of see the track there uh, as the cows are going to be milked um, from there. When we take a look at his, just the data that he sits there and watches his cows. So now instead of uh, milking his cows, he's spending a lot more time uh, just looking at the papers, looking at the computer, trying to, uh, to manage things there. There's a big uh, discussion, as always, about the free flow versus the guided flow. So here in the farm in Belgium, you can see that everything's on slotted floors. You very seldom see them in Europe. In Europe. Um, so everything's on slatted floor, but uh, definitely a very big proponent of um, uh, sort gates. And so milk first, feed first, you know, where does, where does the cow go first? And uh, the big difference I always think is in this fetch rate is when you take a look at the, um, the free flow, you tend to have uh, higher fetch rates than you do with the guided flows um, off to the right there. So how does the... Uh, how does it prepare itself? On the bottom left, you can kind of see there's a little roller wick where the cow, uh, it preps the cow's teeth, be either laser eyes or nighttime vision uh, to be able to attach these and figure where they're at. So it's all individual uh, attachments. So the quarters all get separated and then disinfection can actually be inside the cup or it can be with some kind of a spray. And one thing I would caution is that when I tend to find milk quality problems on these robotic milking farms, when we're trying to troubleshoot some of the issues here, a lot of times we start finding that, say, maybe only two of these teats are getting sprayed when the farmer thinks that all four of them are getting sprayed, or some are just getting sprayed just a tad little bit, and that can definitely cause some milk quality issues. Okay, so one of the biggest reasons why producers, believe it or not, choose one robot over the other is how they can manual attach and I heard that in Europe all the time is just I like this one better just because it's easier to work with if I have to manual attach and sometimes that has to happen um, if you got some problem cows or whatever in the herd. So real quick I'm going to go through a survey of uh, some of the in Iowa that we did um, about three years ago when we take a look at just um, 
how producers took a look at this. What did they do after with management? What's the average cost? And you can see here it's $185,000, $200,000 per robot without the building cost. Their labor efficiency was undoubtedly the, um, the primary goal. And this information is on uh, my website, so I'm not going to take the time to go through this. But you can definitely see graphic form-wise the hours of milking labor before the uh, robotic milking system and afterwards. So definitely a very major uh, milking labor uh, decrease. Milking frequency two times a day beforehand. Afterwards, they're at 2.9. We realize, and I'll show a slide a little bit later, that uh, three time a day milking, like it seems like it is here, really isn't the same response that we get from milking every eight hours um, if the cows just can go milk whenever they want. Fetching cows, about 10 cow fetch cows per robot per day. A decrease in heat detection, again, real simply, if we match rumination data with motion data, we can always pinpoint when that cow needs to be bred. So we have a lot more information about um, um, being able to breed them where some producers would actually say, well, we hardly even look at the cows anymore. We just The computer tells us when to breed them. Um, when you take a look at other things about uh, milking labor, the big thing is that can one person start then milking a lot more cows per uh, per person? And I think that definitely is um, a thought process. When we take a look at 74 cows per robot basis, which is, a, a, and this is with including dry cows, so again, 60 cows per robot is kind of the, uh, the basis of it. Um, if you're high producing Holsteins, you're probably going to be milking fewer than that. Um, you got jerseys or some crossbreds or whatever and you have a lower milk production you might be able to get into that 64 66 uh, per robot but it really depends on the efficiency of, uh, of the system itself when we take a look at milk production I want to talk about this one a little bit because most people would tend to say that we get a milk production increase when they go to their new system so we've had one producer that didn't change anything and actually got probably close to a 36% increase in milk production alone without changing um, his housing system, without changing the feeding system except for the robot, the pellet going into the robot, and a 36% increase. So where do we see most of them? Is that if you get um, a 10% increase, I think is where we see a lot of them, 10 to 12%. But the caution is, is that a lot of times it's 6 to 8% that goes credit to that freestall barn that just got built, and only 3 to 5% goes to the robot. So that's a big distinction when we take a look at the increased production, is that people are very quick to give this production increase credit to the robot when really it's the new facility that probably, probably should get uh, at least three fourths of it. When we take a look at milk production, again, in our survey, we had a 12% increase. Semantic cell counts tend to go down. A lot of times when they first start with the robots, they tend to go up just a tad little bit earlier on, but then they do tend to go down a little bit. How significant our survey showed, pretty significant, but again, this is a, just a few producers in the survey. Okay, when we take a look at um, some response to milking frequency. So from two time a day, you can see these different cows milking at you know four times a day here at five, six, seven, and six and seven hour intervals. Four milkings a day. Milk production increased eight per eighteen percent. Another cow here that's milking three times a day at twelve, seven, and five increased six percent. Cow C fifteen and nine at two milkings per day minus. So you can see that these later lactation cows and if they don't have coming up. Uh, very much that we can actually get decreases in milk production. So if we take a look at um, a two time a day milking, going to a robot, it's like milking close to two and a half, 2.4 to two and a half times a day, and um, three, uh, three point three milkings per day to match um, a three time a day milking. So we've had some producers at three time a day that start ending up with, you know, say 2.9 milkings a day, so they can actually lose production um, by going to a robot. So I'm not going to take the time to uh, go through some of the, the feed things, but basically when we realize the feed is that it gets to be a little bit more expensive with the pellet. Uh, some people actually report less cost with the pellet because they can then put some other byproduct feeds into that pellet that they, could, they couldn't put in prior to that. But for the most part, that pellet's going to cost a little bit more. And the big issue is if we have high energy rations in the PMR, the partially mixed ration, uh, then cows tend to get a little lazy and they don't want to come to the um, robot to get the pellets as much and so the, the milkings actually decrease a little bit. So that's the big lowdown of the um, of the feed management strategies. What then? So when you take a look at the, the pellets, it's all over the board about how many uh, pounds of pellets are being fed. Um, so you can see here we've got the, the maximum about 14 pounds, but now we know that people are starting to get into that 16, 18 uh, pounds of pellet, especially for some of these um, early cow groups. The palatability definitely is a big part of it. 
when we take a look at uh, the feed cost of conventional versus robots, okay, so high producing herds, you can see on the left here the parlor versus the robot. And when you take a look at the um, 120 pounds, the robot's more expensive. When we start getting down to these um, uh, lower milk production averages, the, um, um, <clears throat> the robot can actually be a, a less expensive just because you're ta targeting your feed in some respects to the um, you know, cows that need it where they need it. So when we take a look at these later lactation cows, lower producing cows, and more expensive to feed early lactation, um, higher producing cows in a robot, we realize there's also benefits is that we're not over conditioning cows because you're feeding them exactly what they need based on that level of or stage of lactation. You're rewarding the high cows with the energy that they need, especially in early lactation, so they get that positive energy balance is a big um, piece of that. When you take a look at reproductive management, again, um, we've actually got, seen some increases from some of the studies that have done, and lately he's done a, a, a great study on some of their farms or, or whatever, taking a look at reproductive management. So we'll just basically say that that's a very much of a plus. Um, there's some other issues of concern with culling rates doesn't really change that much. The reasons for so may. Um, electrical use, we've seen that go up and down, but typically it will uh, go down a little bit. And water and chemical usage, um, but that, you know, there's a lot of differences in herd growth and things like that it can change it. But the bottom line is if you ask producers that put in um, uh, robots, I would tend to say that 95 percent of them are extremely happy with them. And um, they say it has improved their cash flow, profitability, and quality of life as well. So those are some of the reasons that we already talked about. Uh, so the labor efficiency definitely is the big one. Uh, flexibility and schedule, which is kind of a labor uh, thing as well. Uh, when you look at payback, um, it definitely is something that can pay back, but again, there may be cheaper ways to actually do this that are going to pay back even a lot faster. So again, it's kind of more of a personal thing. Um, <clears throat> but paybacks in that five to six years are not heard of with a robot. And some people, as we take a look at the investment analysis, uh, take a little bit longer. Um, we'll kind of share towards the end here a little bit more about um, the cash flow versus the financial impact. So the bottom line of robotic milking systems is that cows like them, people tend to like them, and there's a lot of good things that are happening because of them, uh, but they definitely are not the cheapest thing to, to work with either. So we're going to look at the economics of it, and then really, again, like I said, um, it's going to depend on how we um, try to look at it. And so we take a look at um, the different types of systems. So I want to start with this um, herd in Spain. So he was basically telling me as we took a look, he had four robots, and says, now what do I do? I just spent a lot of money 13 years ago to put in these robots, and if I would have put a parlor in at that time, I probably wouldn't be faced with this decision for another five, seven, maybe even 10 years. But the thought process is now I've got a, I'm faced with another big decision. So I tell people that it's important where you're at in your dairy career. And if you've only got 12, 15 years left, they might be an option. If you've got 20 years left, then you're going to be faced with, if you put robots in now, you're going to be faced with robots now and making that decision again and only having five or six years left of your dairy career uh, to actually get the money back out of them. So I think that the time of um, where you're at in your stage of career tends to be a little bit important with it as well. Do you want to go with uh, different types of uh, systems? Um, and there's a lot of different good systems out there, and, like, and I'm not going to say one's better than the other. There's a lot of good um, benefits of each one of these systems to take a look at, so definitely get out and take a look at them. When you take a look at the uh, multi-box system with one robot, yeah, so the second box might come a little cheaper. The third box might even come a little cheaper. And even in the fourth, 35 cows, um, and I'm spending a lot less money on that box, or maybe that box is only half the price of the rest of them. There's a system approach and maybe an economy of scale with this that uh, needs to be taken a look at as well. Um, <clears throat> this is just a diagram, just real quickly, of free flow that I was in Holland with. Um, so they're actually on the right side over here. This is going into a grazing system. So those arrows going outside the barn are actually going into the grazing system. So in the morning, these cows would actually have to come through and actually go through these sort gates here on the left. And if they need to be milked, they're going to be sorted back into the, the um, in here. If not, they get to go into the feed bunk. And once they go into the feed bunk, if there's not feed there, they can go out to pasture or even if there is feed there, it can go out to pasture. But you can see the, the one-way gates going back into where they lay. But they always have to go through these sort gates here to, um, to, to go. So it's kind of like a, um, a milk first type system, but it can also be a feed first type system. So there's a lot of different ways that they can work the, the gating systems. 
again, this is the um, the system with the uh, the guided flow here. So the cows have to go through here before they can get into their feed system. So they're going to be uh, pegged down in this little pen here, and they have to go through the milking system before they can actually work through there. One uh, thing about robots is uh, boss cows. Is so at the end of these robots, make sure we give ourselves a nice lane for these cows and get away from the robot before they meet another cow. And uh, just otherwise, the boss cows are going to hinder some cows from wanting to use the robots. Um, whether you use it on pasture systems or wherever, there's a lot of different uh, gating systems that people can work with. So if a cow wants to go out to pasture but hasn't been milked in the last six hours, she's going to get gated back here and she's got to go through that system before she can go back out. Um, one issue I tend to find, and I think it's important, but I don't have the research to back it up, is some of these systems are uh, designed with only 12 inches of bunk space per cow. And we realize that because the cows are being milked at different times that we can actually reduce the uh, space. But I would still tend to err at this point until we find more research that 18 inches a cow is still um, a minimum, I'd tend to say, for bunk space put in a robotic milking system. This is a rotary parlor. Um, so basically we've got some... Um, um, post dip arms here. We've got some pre dip arms, so we got the detachment. Um, so a lot of different um, things we can take a look at. And I'm not going to spend the time going through these rotary parlors, uh, just because I know Dan wanted me to talk more about the economics of it. But I want to kind of show some of these things. Um, so this is actually a rotary parlor that has all these gated systems, and so these cows can actually go voluntarily into a uh, rotary parlor versus the previous one where they're all going into as a bunch or in this one where the cows come in as a bunch they're loaded into a holding area and then have to go through the system versus the ones that come in off grass they can go in whenever they want so you saw the bomatic version this is the, the gia version of it um, when we take a look at this even though this one doesn't have any robots again taking a look at the economics of it this is a rotary and I was in Australia one morning, and this lady milked uh, 906 cows or something like that, 903 cows by herself in, in uh, six hours. And so if you can find that lady, I would probably hire her and not worry about the robots, but um, they, they may be few and far between to try to find. So do you guys have those people in Vermont that can milk that many cows in that short of a time? So when we take a look at... Um, the economics of it. So I'm going to take a little time here now to actually go through this. This is a, um, a system where we're taking a look at the number of cows in a herd and to try to figure out are these robots worth it. Our milk price at $17.50, the estimated cost per robot at $220,000, the estimated system repair, and this is probably a very big variable because I've got some systems that we're working with that are very expensive and $7,000 per robot are not even cutting it in some of these systems. Okay, so we've got others that report that this is too high, some report that it's too low, but this is what we're kind of pegging over the course of, uh, say, 10 years of this robot is $7,000 um, enough, and so when you do this, you've got to make that estimation of what that uh, robot repair cost is. So a lot of these companies have um, some data that they might even be willing to share that this farm is paying this much for repairs, this farm's paying this much, but that's the number I definitely want to know before I decide to put in a robot. So we're going to put two robots into this for the 144 cows, so around 60 cows milking per robot with the dry cows. Years of useful life is kind of a, um, a difficult one. Um, is it going to last 10 years? Is it going to last 20 years? We would tend to say that if we're going to budget, I'd probably go in that somewhere between 10 to 15 years. 13 years seems to be a pretty um, uh, good one that people are, are feel comfortable with. And what's the value of that robot after its useful life? If you spend two hundred thousand dollars and decide to sell it after those ten years, is it still worth forty thousand? Okay, so that's a pretty important part of the value of trying to figure out if this thing is um, makes financial sense. Your interest rate, and so the propensity of people to put a robot in maybe your older generation farmer that has cash available or investments available in the you know three to five percent on his money or her money is not that big of a deal or sometimes our younger farmers that can get these low interest loans for beginning farmer loans may have a higher propensity to put in a robot than some of our middle-aged generation type farmers we want to make sure we insure this we've already had a few fires on a, a robot farm so you want to make sure that this is going to be insured and covered the hours of milking labor, so we're going to go from, if I would have had a milking parlor, uh, milking about 120 cows a day, six and a half hours per day in the uh, in the parlor, including setup and cleanup, and now my milking labor is going to be down to about an hour and a half, and surveys have shown that I think these are pretty accurate. 
the current hours of heat detection going from a half an hour today actually to next to nothing. Labor rate for milking and heat detection, hours for records management, hours for labor management, and what is your labor worth. So we've kind of put those variables into it, um, into this analysis as well. So the milk per day at 70 pounds, we're expected about a 10% increase. Okay, so again, three to 5% is gonna get credited to the uh, um, robot itself. The others is probably gonna be because we put a new um, uh, freestyle barn up or something like that. So, but if you put in about 10, uh, 10% um, that's where most people are going with uh, if they made any changes in facilities or whatever. So somatic cell count decreasing just a tad little bit. Um, the reproduction and herd health value of the software. So what is it worth to have all this information on your herd now that you previously did not have? Um, I put into the, this $35 a cow, but is this realistic because this information could be worth a lot more than what I'm uh, putting in here, but I just uh, for sake of um, Example, that's what we've got in here. And then we're also gonna have some feed costs and intake changes, and so uh, that cost per pound of dry matter, um, and is it gonna increase and decrease? And so some people are gonna say one way or another, so it's really gotta be numbers for your farm to put into this. What's the cost of replacement heifers? Um, what's the cull cow value? Uh, the call rate's not going to change much, okay, and the utilities and supplies. And so when you take a look at all those variables, um, that's kind of the sum of the variables that we're going to put into it. Now we're going to take a look at what this um, might actually look like. So when you take a look at the increased milk production, okay, so again, that 10% increased milk production, the milk price premium because of the increased somatic cell count, the increased incomes here is actually a negative one because our cull rate actually went down, so we're selling less cull cows. So our total increased incomes is 63489 And our decreased expenses of the heat detection labor, the milk labor, which is a huge one, and the reduced labor management, so our decreased expenses of 38000 gives us a total positive impact on the left side of 102000 And if we go to the negative impacts, and one of the negative impacts is going to be the um, capital recovery cost on these robots with depreciation and interest. And so this 60000 is going to take a look at that $200,000 per robot minus the $40,000 of value at the end of this robot's life. So we just have 160000 that's going to get divided up over um, that 10 years plus the interest charge that we got to pay the, uh, the, not really pay the bank here, but just that capital recovery charge, uh, the 5.5% that's added into that as well. So again, I said repair and maintenance, um, that 16,000 there, um, that could fluctuate very dramatically from one year to the next. We've got our increase in feed costs, and so when we take a look at that increase in milk production, people often forget to put the increase in feed costs that goes along with that. We've got our increased cow replacement costs, which is actually, again, a negative number because our call rate now went down the utilities, the records management. So our total increased expenses is 101,080. And does this slide show all the way on your screen? You can see the whole slide. Looks like it. Okay, so um, we have no decreased incomes. So our negative impact is um, 101,000. Our positive impact was 102,471. So our net financial impact is a positive $1,391. So the nice thing about it, at least it's positive. And when we take a look at, the, um, so this is kind of take a look at, is it profitable for us to do it? It may be, um, this is positive. Your numbers may be a little bit different than this, or they could be a lot different than that. But the value of the quality of life that people put into that um, gives it a positive impact of about 10,390. So this is more on the profit financial impact side which doesn't tell the whole story because your lender really doesn't care if it's profitable like this. They need to know if you're gonna be able to pay back this loan. <clears throat> so now we're going to uh, take a look at just, you know, some of these things that change the sensitivity, the milk price, the years of uh, life. Um, and I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these, but there's a lot of things that uh, can change just by a little bit that can really change this analysis as well. So the more important part, I think, is to actually go through the cash flow analysis. And this is where people are really trying to sell the robots, saying that these things cash flow. And yes, they cash flow. And even if something is cash flow, it does not mean that it's profitable. 
Okay, so let's just kind of go through this. So now we've got a seven-year loan. So our lenders uh, loan this over seven years. Yes, yeah, some are, but if you can really roll it into a total building project, you might get uh, a 10 to 12 year loan, which might be a little bit easier to pay back. So you just bought a piece of equipment that's expected to last 10, 12, 15 years, and now the bank says that you're expected to pay this thing back in seven years. So that could be a little bit of an issue uh, trying to get at that. So our interest rate at five and a half percent, a principal amount of 400,000 uh, on these two robots. So the first year payment down on the bottom right of 68,976, that's the number I want you to remember because this is what you've got to pay back to the bank even though your annual cost might be quite a bit lower than that because of the uh, difference in time frames, the years of loan versus the life of the robot. Okay, so our net in financial impact from that partial budget analysis was 1,391. And now the capital recovery cost of the robots in that net financial impact was 60,000. But the bank says that we need to pay back $68,976. Okay, so we've got to pay this back faster. So that changes the um, cash flow difference of the capital recovery versus the annual payment by a negative $8,776. Okay, so now we're cash negative on this uh, robot. But we also have some other issues that could be going on. And so our heat detection and milking labor saved is $35,000. But we were only hiring 20000 of that. 15000 of that was our own labor that we weren't paying ourselves for. And so that creates another negative $15,040 on this thing. So again, the net financial impact was positive. The fact that we got to pay back to the bank faster than the life of this robot is going to be a negative thing and then plus a lot of that cash that we're going to be or the labor we're going to be saving wasn't being cashed out anyway so now we've got a total change in AMS automatic milking system cash flow of a negative 22,000 so from that earlier slide that I was sharing when you take a look at um, a positive net financial impact now cash flow wise it actually can be uh, quite negative. So that's why I tend to say that sometimes this could be a minus $50,000 in cash flow. It might be anywhere, especially if you include the family quality of life, you know, it could be a positive $50,000. So again, it really depends on how we um, are taking a look at, at that. So, so one of the questions that I had uh, about the range between positive and negative cash flow, that's quite a gulf. And, um, it is how much of that is tied up in say like let's say opportunity cost whether or not you could be doing something else with all that time that you're saving or is there is it really that much different from farm to farm um, I would tend to say there's a lot of variability farm to farm first of all because we realize that you know some of these robots we're getting 6,000 pounds of milk per day out of them and some robots we're only getting 3,200 pounds a day out of them Okay, so that variability in and of itself, how much milk we're harvesting has a big impact on that total um, uh, profitability of it. And so if they're not getting very much milk and they spent that much, that's kind of a big cash flow drain too. So that big golf that you're talking about is huge just based on uh, what's happening on the farm. So opportunity cost of labor, I'm glad you brought that up because when you take a look at, you know, what's your labor worth as a manager? And I think this is where the the, um, the robots can kind of um, sell themselves in some respect. You know, if you're just going to take that labor and go into town and read the newspaper or sit at home and drink a beer or something like that, then what did you really gain? But if you're going to take that labor and now make it a very useful thing that you can spend more time, like Dan said, uh, make sure your hay gets put up. Um, more management time going through there really depends. If you can put more management time into that farm then I would tend to say it's some pretty good labor to, uh, to be working with. So these robotic milking systems um, are definitely working very well in pasture systems as well as confinement. So you're going to have fewer cows per robot on the confinement side. When you take a look at pastures, they're not being milked with the frequency. So they might be able to start stretching out into um, you know, 65, 70 uh, cows milking uh, per robot. So it really depends on these different goals that producers might um, have with them. But I just... Um, you know, these are definitely working on different types of systems. And the Kellogg Biological Research Station is kind of, a, I think, a good example of this, where they've got a robotic um, uh, dairy for both their pasture systems and their conventional systems and just trying to do some um, research kind of cross